Peace, love, and light to the family. This is Darius Corbin reporting live. I welcome you all to the Darius Corbin Mystery School. It's been a while, but really it hasn't. It's good to see y'all again. Thank you for inviting me in your homes, your vehicles, wherever I may be. I thank you. Tonight, once again, I want to give a beautiful shout out to my ancestors, to the beautiful Sylvia Brown. For those who have watched the uh, original Darius Corbin YouTube channel, you see I have done prophecies on the future and past based on his sister's work. So today, I'm going to continue the great legacy of the sister, Sylvia Brown. My title for this, based on the work of this book, Secret Societies, where she breaks down certain secret societies within our generations and within our lifetime. The true meaning and the true purpose of these secret societies so what i'm going to do today is i'm going to label this one life after the crucifixion the untold story of jesus now, like i try to tell many people so many times is you cannot have one book and live your truth and live what you think is your truth based off of this one book without doing thorough research on the other books that may be there presently for you. You can't be that cocky, that egotistic to not think that there isn't more out there than what you've been told. Some people are so egotistic, they don't even want to challenge their own religion. They don't even want to challenge their own belief. It's all good, because tonight, we're going to go a little bit deeper with the help of our ancestor, Sylvia Brown. I don't want to tear you on too long. I want to get right straight to it. Life after the crucifixion, the untold story of Jesus the Christ. Go ahead, man. Talk your shit. Say less. Early Christian sets adopted various forms of Gnostic philosophy, including the concept that Jesus was not the Son of God or God incarnate, but rather just a divine messenger. Their reasons for this belief varies, but the main one was that the Messiah didn't die on the cross, but instead lived a very long life on earth as a husband and a father. Early Christian sects adopted various forms of Gnostic philosophy, including the concept that Jesus was not the Son of God or God incarnate, but rather just a divine messenger. Their reason for this belief varied, but the main one was that the Messiah didn't die on the cross, but instead lived a very long life on earth as a husband and father. Now, it did say their reason for this vary. Now, let me give you another reason why their belief varied. For those who have stayed tuned to the Darius Corbin channel throughout the years, for the ones who even subscribed on this channel, the Mystery School, where we go deeper into the gnosis that I taught in the last videos, Thank you, by the way, for subscribing. For those who have watched my previous videos, you see me do a video on a guy named Apollonius of Tiana. And for my pastors and for my bishop and for my Christian theologians who are watching tonight, thank you for watching first and foremost. But to my Christian theologians, I say this. If you haven't heard of Apollonius of Tiana, then already we have a problem and you see why I say now it's time for you guys to sit back and sit down and let the Christ consciousness people speak to the people so the people can wake up and know who their true worth is and know what their true worth is. Because if you have studied Apollonius of Tiana and some people out there are saying, well, spell it, let me try. 
Apollonius is A P O L L O N I U S of Tiana. And I do believe Tiana is T Y A N A. Apollonius of Tiana. But as you know, Google is your best friend. So, and if you want, you look at and research Apollonius of Tiana, you see that everything that we know Jesus the Christ to have done in these miraculous ways, Apollonius of Tiana, to the T, did the same thing. Apollonius to the T did the same things around the same time that Jesus did has done, excuse me, the same time that Jesus was around doing these things, Apollonius of Tiana was around doing the same thing too, with the following to match Jesus to Christ. Look that up and get back with me because like I said, you know, I know a lot of people watch my videos, but I don't ever hear feedback, comments. I am here to challenge you, not debate you. I am here to challenge you to learn more than what your churches have given you. In June 1973, and before I continue on, for those who may not or may know Sylvia Brown, she channels energies. She channels spirits. And one spirit always stayed with her since a little kid, and that spirit was Francine. So when you hear about her talking about Francine in these upcoming paragraphs, just know that she is channeling Francine and Francine is channeling her energy, her energy from the cosmic world, from the astral world, from the worlds beyond that we don't talk about in our churches. A lot of people go to church and they say they feel the Holy Ghost, but what's that? That's your ancestors to a certain degree. That's that spiritual energy that you have lying dormant in your body that is coming out. And for church people, the only real spiritual attainment they can get is within those music tones and within those people singing and them drums playing. No different than our ancient ancestral lineage. So it reigns familiar. So let's get back to where we're going. In June 1973, my spirit guide, Francine, and this is Sylvia Brown speaking, in June 1973, my spirit guide, Francine, stated in a research trance, that the Vatican had hidden many books that should be in the Bible. We know this for a fact, family. And they were never to be released to the public. This is also what Michael Bajent, and I spell B-A-I-G-E-N-T, the author of the Jesus Papers and co-author of Holy Blood, Holy Grail, and the Masonic Legacy, maintains is true. He theorizes that many of these Gospels, and I quote, Gospels, were written at least 30 years after Christ's supposed death. Francine said that the Christian Bible didn't really settle into its final form for at least 300 years. At least 300 years until the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Now, how many of us could remember everything that happened 30 years ago after an event? let alone 30 years later, especially if most of it was passed down by all tradition. Word of mouth is always sketchy because people can put their own spin on the story or elaborate on it to make it more dramatic or even give themselves more importance. And that's what we, as adults, into this woken consciousness stage that a lot of us have entered to, have understand that history is what? Exactly, his story. Let's keep reading. Anyway, my guide explained that what the Vatican is hiding is proof about Jesus surviving the crucifixion. I can hear some of you now saying, and she says, Sylvia, you have gone a little too far this time, quote, end quote. Where are my, well, my dear ones, she says, the evidence is piling up. Although it isn't, although it isn't incontrovertible, as of yet, I expect that it will become so with new archaeological finds or the discovery of a long-lost document that's been kept hidden for centuries. So let's explore the possibilities that this shocking secret 
that's been covered for so long might indeed be fat. And how y'all doing out there? Everybody good? You know, I appreciate each and every one of y'all that that watches and views this. And most importantly, for the ones who actually do the research, that actually listens with a pen and pad and research this. And they may not discuss it amongst people in public, but internally they keep this. I love you so much. I love all of you so much. What really happened at the crucifixion? Y'all ready? Let's go. Francine has stated on at least three occasions that Pontius Pilate, that's Pontius Pilate, and he was a Roman emperor at the time of uh, Jesus, excuse me, a Roman official, excuse me, he was a Roman official at the time of Jesus. Francine has stated on at least three occasions that Pontius Pilate didn't want Jesus to die on the cross because he didn't feel that Christ was a threat to Rome. Pilate's wife, whom he adored and respected, also had a dream on the eve of the trial that persuaded her to beg her husband not to condemn the young Jew. This, along with Pilate's own belief in Christ's innocence, comes through in the Bible when the Roman leader asks, and I quote, What evil has he done? And says that, and I quote again, I am innocent of the blood of this righteous man. Do as you please. And that's Matthew 27. This later statement was made while he washed his hands of the affair. It's out of my hands. Y'all do what y'all want with that man. Michael Bajan has written that Jesus was in favor of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin. And I spelled S-A-N-H-E-R. Excuse me. Let me spell that again, family. That's S-A-N-H-E-D-R-I-N. Or the Supreme Council and Tribunal of the Jews having to pay taxes. So let me read that again. Michael Bajan has written that Jesus was in favor of the Sanhedrin or the Supreme Council and Tribunal of the Jews having to pay taxes, which would have endeared him to Pilate and shown that he wasn't a traitor to Rome. Remember that Christ says, and I quote, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, end quote, Mark 12, 17 which shows that he knew taxes had to be paid. Francine claims that there was a conspiracy among Pontius Pilate, Jesus, and some of Christ's followers, namely Joseph of Arimathea, and remember that name, we're going to talk more about him in a minute, family, and perhaps Nicodemus, or Nicodemus, I'm pretty sure it's Nicodemus, Nicodemus to have Jesus go through and and I quote, there's a lot of, and I quote, an execution that would appear as real as possible. Let me read that again. Francine claims that there was a conspiracy among Pontius Pilate, Jesus, and some of Christ's followers, namely Joseph of Arimathea and perhaps Nicodemus, to have Jesus go through an execution that would appear as real as possible. Pilate promised that he would do whatever he could do to make sure that the Messiah wouldn't die. To that end, the Roman leader had the event take place late on the day before the Sabbath. There could be no executions after sunset on this day. And none on the Sabbath itself. And no bodies could be left on the cross after the sun went down. He also made sure that the cross had a footrest at that Christ's legs was broken so that he could push himself up to breathe more. And that's it more. Let me read that again. The Roman leader had the event take place on the day before the Sabbath. There could be no executions after sunset on this day. And none of the Sabbath itself, and no bodies could be left on the cross after the sun went down. He also made sure that the cross had a footrest and that Christ's legs weren't broken so that he could push himself up to breathe. And it says more, and more on that in a bit. While Jesus was scourged, as was the custom, it was certainly not the way that Mel Gibson portrayed it in The Passion of Christ. In fact, the man was given an opiate to ease his pain. It said that Jesus was given an opiate to ease his pain. Christ was also pierced in the side, again, as was the custom, but not hard enough to kill him. 
And Francine says that Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy merchant, also came prepared to do his part. When Jesus said, and I quote, I thirst, he was given a special type of sedative that Joseph had prepared, which knocked him unconscious. Since Jesus was in a death-like state, he was taken down from the cross after only a few hours. Most folks took two or three days to die when crucified, even when they used to impale people on stakes, and that's I-M-P-A-L, in ancient Egypt. It took them many hours and sometimes days to perish. Now, I'm sure that what Christ went through was indeed horrendous, but it's hard to believe that a healthy 33-year-old man could have died in three hours. It's unclear why the Romans didn't then stick Jesus in the ground where he surely would have died. Instead, Joseph of Arimathea and several others immediately placed him in a rather accessible tomb. It was a hui, or it spells H-E-W-E-D-O-U-T. It was a he wet out room of solid rock that stood above the ground with a stone to cover the entrance that just happened to belong to Joseph himself. An often overlooked nugget of information regarding the, this comes from France, Renice Le Chateau. There's a stained glass window in the Church of the Madeleine there that depicts three men carrying Jesus by his tomb. But the moon is high in the sky. Now, since we know that Jesus would never have been buried by someone at night over the Sabbath, this indicates that he wasn't being carried into the tomb, but out of it. Then there was Nicodemus, or Nicodemus, I'm pretty sure it's Nicodemus though. It's spelled on here N-I-C-H-O-D-E-M-U-S, but I also seen it spelled without the H. But it says, then there's Nicodemus, or Nicodemus, whom by the way Jesus visited during his lifetime. It's been reported in many historical journeys that Nicodemus was a healer and could see the future. And he went to Christ's tomb with the spices and other it says accoutrements. Francine reports that these weren't to keep the body from rotting or spoiling, as the Jews were into weren't into embalming. These substances were intended to revive Jesus. This is all pure fantasy, you say. Well, let's review some facts. Roman crucifixions ensure torturous deaths by breaking the condemned individual's legs and keeping footrests off of the crosses. You see. Victims with footrests and unbroken legs would be able to push themselves up to a certain degree to relieve pressure on their diaphragms, but this only served to prolong the inevitable, as exhaustion will kick in and they eventually suffocate, sometimes after several days. So why was Jesus given the tools for a longer stay on the cross, even though he was put up just a few hours before the Sabbath deadline? The Romans broke the legs of the thieves who were also being crucified, so why didn't they do the same to him? The piercing of the side of the victim on the cross was to check for death. And as John uh, chapter 19 verse 34 states, and I quote, Both one of the soldiers pierced Christ's side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. End quote. This indicates a few things. One, there was a buildup of liquid around his heart and lungs, common in crucifixions. Two, Jesus was still alive because of the immediacy of the flow of that liquid. And three, the piercing could very well have helped him survive because it released pressure. Yet the soldiers declared him dead, learned physicians that they were, with a question mark. And Christ's body was immediately removed because sunset was approaching. Now, to be fair, Christian scholars say that the rapidity of Jesus' death on the cross was due to trauma, and he'd been scorned so mercilessly that he probably died of heart failure. That's what they're saying Christians would say. They point out that he was so weak that he couldn't carry the cross and fell several times on the way to the crucifixion site. Yes, Jesus was whipped before his trial, but he also appeared before Pilate twice and was sent over to Herod, he presumably walked between all the different courts, so he couldn't possibly have made it if he was scourged to the point that Mel Gibson feels betrays 
There's also no proof that Romans didn't adhere or adhere to the Jewish laws of, and I quote, no more than 40 lashes. Deuteronomy chapter 12, 25, verse 2 to 3. In addition, if Pilate was in a conspiracy to save Christ's life, as Francine says, it's doubtful that he would have him beaten heavily. Even so, the scourging probably did sap his strength, although he was only 33 and strong and healthy. Coupled with not having any sleep during the course of his trial by the Jewish elders, it all probably took its toll. Thus, he fell several times and struggled to carry a cross that weighed 150 pounds or more. Yet that weakness doesn't necessarily explain his supposed quick death. As the Bible points out, and I quote, Pilate marveled that he was already dead, so he called the centurion and asked him if he had already died. Mark chapter 15, verse 44. Christian scholars might be able to assert that Christ did in fact die on the cross, but their argument begins to break down when faced with what happened after the crucifixion. If Jesus was resurrected, for example, would there be any reason for the removal of the stone sealing the entrance to his tomb? After all, his resurrected body would be in spirit form and unable to be bound by any human-made structure. Obviously, that stone needed to be removed so that his physical body could get out. I know some people would say that someone removed Christ's corpse for safekeeping and then buried it elsewhere. But if Jesus already had a tomb, why put him in another? And the question about the plausibility of a survival, don't stop there. As we know from scripture, Mary Madeline is the one who discovers the open tomb. Mark chapter 6, 9. Also John chapter 20, uh, verse 1. She then notifies Peter and John, the beloved, of what she's found. They come to verify what she said to them and then depart, excuse me, leaving Mary sobbing at the tomb by herself. She peers in again and sees two angels who ask, and I quote, Why do you seek the living among the dead? That's Luke chapter 24, verse 5. She explains that she's looking for Jesus so that she can take him away. I quote again, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. And quote John chapter 20, verse 14. Notice that she didn't say buried. Notice that she didn't say buried. Mary Madeline then sees Jesus, but doesn't recognize him. She thinks that he's a gardener asking him, and I quote, my Lord, if you are the one who has taken him away, Tell me where you have laid him, and I will go and take him away. In quote, John chapter 20, verse 15. The reason that Mary doesn't recognize Christ is fairly obvious. He was in disguise and hiding from the Jews. Second, did this woman really think she could carry a dead man's body? Of course not. She knew that Jesus was alive because she helped take him from the cross. She helped take him from the cross. After Christ calls Mary by her name, she then knows who he is. He goes on to tell her not to touch him. And many Christians believe that this is because he hasn't ascended to his father in heaven yet. However, those who know that Jesus survived interpret this a bit differently. With his wounds still not healed, he simply didn't want Mary to give him an enthusiastic hug or embrace which would have caused him pain. Later on, according to the gospel, Jesus appears before his apostles to prove that he's alive. I, for one, can under can't understand how this can be misinterpreted, but it has been so. So, but it has been. So let's go through it, starting with Luke chapter 24, verse 36 and 51. From George Lamas' translation from the original. Americ or um yeah Americ text by thoughts or in the brackets, and it says, and while they were discussing these things, Jesus stood among them and said to them, and they were confused and frightened for they thought they saw a spirit. Peace be with you. It is I. Do not be afraid. Notice here that they thought Christ was a ghost, 
for they thought him dead. Jesus said to them, Why do you tremble, and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet, that is, that it is. Feel me and understand, for a spirit has no flesh and bones, as you see I have. Here we see Jesus trying to explain that he isn't a ghost. As I've explained numerous times, spirits don't carry wounds or have a solid countenance that can be touched and felt as you or I do. This can only mean one thing. Christ is alive in a real body, not a glorified one. When he said, th when he said these things, he showed them his hands and his feet. And as they did still did not, excuse me, and as they still did not believe because of their joy, and they were bewildered, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a portion of a broiled fish and of a honeycomb, and he took it and ate it before their eyes. Here again, my Christian family, Jesus shows his apostles that he's alive by eating, yet spirits don't need food. And he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you when I was with you, that everything must be fulfilled which is written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then he opened their mind to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, and it was right, that Christ should suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance should be preached in his name for the forgiveness of sins among all nations. And the beginning will be from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and I will send upon you the promise of my Father, but remain in the city of Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. Notice here that Jesus only said, notice here that Jesus only says he should suffer and rise from the dead to fulfill the prophecies about the Messiah. He doesn't say that he died or is dead, but indeed did go from his tomb and make himself known on the third day. Even though he's alive, he still fulfilled the prophecies as written. It should also be noted here that the fulfillment of the prophecies is mainly one of interpretation. Christians say that he fulfilled them, while Jews say he didn't. In reviewing these predictions, I found most, if not all, of them very obtuse. It seems that Christianity has put its own interpretations on what prophecy is, and it has blatantly misinterpreted many of them as being about the Messiah. And he took them out as far as Bethany and lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he parted from them and went up to heaven. Notice here that it says he parted from them. If that was the case, how would they know that he gone up to heaven? If Jesus survived, he would have used his common sense and just fled from the land where he could be recognized and persecuted again on trumped up charges. One of the biggest events portrayed in the scriptures that seem to confirm that Jesus survived the crucifixion is the confrontation with Thomas related to John. Ver, uh, chapter 20, verse 24 to 29. But Thomas, one of the twelve who was called the twin, was not there with them when Jesus came. And the disciples said to him, We have seen our Lord. He said to them, Unless I see in his hands the marks of the nails and put my fingers in them and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Eight days later, the disciples were again indoors and Thomas with them. Jesus came when the doors were locked and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and reach out your hand and put it into my side, and be not faithless but believing. Thomas answered, saying to him, O my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Now you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen me and have believed. Clearly, Jesus is alive, going against the common axiom, and that's spelled A-X-I-O-M, of Christians that Christ died and rose on the third day. We see here that it's at least eight days before Thomas sees him. Christian scholars will reply that Jesus rose and then went back to visit the apostles, anoint them with the Holy Spirit, and send them out to preach. Yes, he probably did do all this, but he could very well have been alive for it. Consider that in the Bible, only the books of Mark and Luke say that Jesus went to heaven, and both apostles are very vague about it. 
They never confirmed that they witnessed his ascension, but rather just assume he did. Also keep in mind that the book of John ends with these words. And I like these words. I like these words. Let me read that part again. Also keep in mind that the book of John ends with these words. Listen, clo listen closely. How y'all doing out there? And I quote, There are also a great many other things which Jesus did, which, if they were written one by one, not even this world, I believe, could contain the books that would be written. I don't care how long you've been watching this right here. I don't care until this point if you got anything I just said. Hopefully you do. I'm sure you do for my elite light ones. The sons and daughter of God. If you can understand this, this explains everything about your Christian Orthodox Christian mainstream religion. Keep in mind, family, that the book of John ends with these words. And I quote, There are also a great many other things which Jesus did, which, if they were written one by one, not even this world. I believe could contain the books that will be written. That's John chapter 21, 25, verse 25. Couldn't this be relating to the works performed after his supposed death? If Christ did indeed survive the crucifixion, and I believe he did, it would be natural for him to want to keep it a secret. So aside from his disciples, Mary Madeline and a few others, he told no one about what had happened. He hid from the Jews and Romans, traveled in the skies to keep from being recognized, and then left Israel for parts of the world in which he wouldn't be so high profiled. Many legends and myths describe him visiting the Americas, India, Turkey, France, and England. He could very well have done so and continue his work for God. In the Jesus Papers, Michael Bajan reports that he found a wealthy Italian businessman who claimed that he possessed two letters written by Jesus to the Sanhedrin, stating that he was still alive in A.D. 34, and then again in A.D. 45. Bajan said that he'd promised the man who owned the documents that he wouldn't reveal his name to keep him in a complete anonymy, which of course makes everyone suspicious. But Mr. Bajan did see the letter himself. They were written in Aramaic, or, yeah, Am Aramaic, and like, Aramic, pretty much, the language of Jesus, and that's A-R-A-M-A-I-C, Aramic, the language of Jesus. And he was convinced that they were indeed from Christ. Now, what made this so interesting to me is that 30 years ago, Francine told our research group that Jesus had written sparingly after the crucifixion, only to tell the Jewish rabbis that he was still alive. To have it come out even after uh, suspicion and the Jesus Papers was overwhelming. And it was a validation of Francine's information. Sure, it may be all coincidence, but it's certainly a very strong and believable one. Francine also said that Jesus lived to be close to 90 years of age in France. So as late as A.D. 45, he would have been around 78 years old, assuming that he was 33 at the time of the crucifixion. As a scripture recount, so if you do the math, it fits. And I'm going to end with the Magdalene factor. I don't think we got too much left, do we? A little bit more, but I'll let you guys read off of that. But we'll see how long this goes. This might go for an hour. This might go for an hour. This is the Madeline factor. Like Mary Madeline. I say Madeline. This is a, uh, the Madeline factor. Mary Madeline. Many Jesuits I've talked to over the years have told me that they believe Christ survived, but they had to keep it quiet. And I express many times I love Pope John uh, the 23rd, especially when he stated that Christ's resurrection from the dead shouldn't be the cornerstone that Christianity 
is based on. Why would we have said such a thing, or excuse me, why would he have said such a thing if he didn't know something about what I'm sharing with you in this chapter? Nevertheless, even the notion that Jesus had a family is sacrilege of the highest order to most Christians. Sacrilegious, probably. Or, yeah, sacrilegious of the highest order to most Christians. Y'all would, y'all can't even imagine that Jesus survived and had some kids. Him and Mary Madeline got busy, had some kids that moved out and got away from it and still survived this. But what if it was? This is not just the only research and the only information about Jesus surviving the crucifixion. This is just one I want you to start off with if you do care about that. Nevertheless, even the notion that Jesus had a family is sacrilegious of the highest order to most Christians. Yet, just as evidence of his surviving the crucifixion is coming out, so is proof of his marriage to Mary Madeline and the children they had together. Here again, such a premise supposedly threatens the very foundation of Christianity. But if something has been built on lies and cover-ups, then it deserves to be tore down. Let me say that again. Because I think some of y'all think I'd be bullshitting with this work that I do. When I tell you I'm a Christ consciousness, and there are many on this planet like me doing the work, we are nothing to be played with because we're not coming with bullshit lies and just looking for attention and fame. We came here because we were on a mission to save the ones that need to be saved. Everybody don't want to be saved, and that's understandable. But for the ones that do, that want to understand their spiritual liberation, they deserve people like me to at least give them something to research, grab on, and have that call of action. This is not a game. And for those who may think it, you can just end this video right now. Here again, such a premise supposedly threatens the very foundation of Christianity. But if something has been built on lies and cover-ups, then it deserves to be torn down. It's interesting how the Catholic Church initially portrayed Mary Madeline. Although the early church probably knew the truth about her, they, they decided to project an image of her as a hairy harlot, excuse me, as a harlot, H-A-R-L-O-T, in order to further conceal the fact that she was married to Jesus. As most of us know, even though her status as a prostitute was changed and admitted as an era, did you know that, Christian scholars? To my church congregation on this beautiful Sunday. Did you know that? Because a lot of y'all, I know when I was in church, how about y'all that went to church as kids and even go to church now? They always kept in there that Mary was a prostitute. But listen, and for those who, as most of us know, even though her status as a prostitute was changed, and admitted as an error in 1969 by the Second Vatican Council, the stigma is still there. The church has always said that the Pope is infallible, but here we see a Pope and the church itself taking one stance and then changing it later on. The problem I have with this isn't that they admitted a mistake and corrected it. That's laudable. It's that the mistake was made in the first place. How can a church... How can the church say that their interpretation of scripture is correct and then admit error? If they erred in this case, hmm, what about others? And aside, I always had a problem with religions interpreting holy writings, for they tend to do so for their own advantage. Rebel that I am, I have long been skeptical about t taking the Bible literally. How many of their how many of my people out there watching this? By show of hands, don't worry, I can see you. How many of y'all literally, literally take the Bible for truth? Go ahead, show your hands. Let's go. Shame, shame, shame. Rebel that I am, I've long been skeptical about taking the Bible literally as a fact-based tome 
that Christian scholars base their conclusions on. I found that there are so many inconsistencies and contradictions within these pages that it's absurd. From a logical viewpoint, and if you just use good old common sense, my beautiful people, to take the premises that, and I quote, if it's in the Bible, it must be fact, end quote, borders on the ridiculous. If you study the history of the makeup of the New Testament, for instance, it's almost a joke to assume that it's factual because it's been edited, added to, deleted from, and what have you countless times. Did you know this? The Bible has been remixed so many times that they could call Diddy and JD together, Kanye too, and we have a whole soundtrack. Did you know that? Things have been added and omitted. Lies added. Truth omitted. Not to mention the fact that so many of his books were deemed heretical by the church. And today, so-called experts admit that they still don't know who wrote the four Gospels. Yet, we're supposed to accept them as fact. I wonder if anyone has ever thought that maybe Dan Brown wrote them in a previous arc incarnation. I don't know who Dan Brown is. Maybe that was a side joke. Thank God more and more scholars are taking other written writings into consideration, such as the Apocryphy or Apocryphia. And I spelled A-P-O-C-R-Y-P-H-A. I have done videos on this. Or the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Nag Hammond scriptures, the Gnostic texts, whatever you want to call them. And even works from other cultures and religions. New discoveries in archaeology are adding to the mix. And although attempting to piece together our history can often feel like a crapshoot, at least objective scientists are trying to include findings from as many sources as possible. Now, getting back to the premise that Jesus was married and had children, many Christians insist there is no mention of this in the Bible. Here we go again, she says. If it's not in the Bible, then it can't be true to that end. I simply say, and I quote, there are also no writings to say that he wasn't a husband and father, end quote. In fact, there's definitely more circumstantial evidence to indicate that he actually was wedded to Mary Madeline. For example, customs of the time didn't recognize a rabbi unless he was married. And books in the in Apocryphy or Apocryphia mentioned that he often kissed Mary on the mouth. Are those the actions of a celibate rabbi who also just happens to be the Messiah? Mary Madeline was with Jesus at his crucifixion, was part of the group that laid him to rest and took herbs and ointments to the tomb on the morning after the Sabbath to anoint him, even though she would have had no hope of moving that sealing stone. She was the first to find the stone removed and the tomb empty and the first to see him after his supposed death. Some people even view her action as those of a grieving widow. I don't because she hadn't actually lost her husband. I contend that Mary was at the tomb to help heal Jesus with her ointments. And while she knew that it would be open, she was completely surprised to find it empty as she thought Christ would be inside. Her initial reaction was simply, where is he? Where has he gone? Who took him? She knew that he was alive, but felt something terrible had happened to him. That's why she didn't uh, run to, to, excuse me, that's why she didn't run to tell Peter and John that the tomb was open, but rather that he was missing. These actions are completely consistent with those of a worried wife. Francine says that it was actually Jesus and Mary Madeline own wedding at Cana, that's spelled C-A-N-A, in which he made wine from water. If you read this portion of the Bible over again with the knowledge that it was his responsibility as the bridegroom to provide the wine, it becomes very interesting. And I quote, and the master of the banquet, best man, tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, 
everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. John uh, chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. The bridegroom is told that he saved his best wife for last. And who made the wine? Jesus did. According to the Gospel of Mary Madeline, which was eliminated from the Bible by the Catholic Church along with those by Philip and Thomas, according to the Gospel of Mary Madeline, which was eliminated from the Bible by the Catholic Church along with the Philip and Thomas Gospels, Family, if you're still watching in 45 minutes, I love you. Research the Gnostic uh, Gospels, the Dead Sea Scrolls, so you get the truth, and stop letting these pastors and preachers brainwash you into stuff they don't even want to research because they just want to keep that money flowing. Not all of them, but a majority of them. And to my Christian family, for those who want to learn the truth, and want to continue to be Christians, true Christians, like the Cathars were, which is my next video. It's going to be very, it's going to be a very drama, traumatic, dramatic story on the Cathars, the early Christians. But for those who really want the science and don't want to be judged, watch, listen, watch these channels that I'm giving to you so you can have the knowledge, so you can be a, a Christian, a true enlightened Christ one, and not to be disregarded or disrespected by who you are spiritually. According to the Gospel of Mary Madeline, which was eliminated from the Bible by the Catholic Church, um, I got to keep saying this because you guys, when you go to church, you were following the work of the Catholics. They gave you their work and you've been following this for hundreds of years. You're too afraid to go into your African spirituality, which still holds Christian Christianity weight. But anyway, I'm going to read that one more time so I can get inside your psyche because when you go to sleep at night, I want you to hear this voice, my voice, say this repeatedly in your head. According to the Gospel of Mary Madeline, which was eliminated from the Bible by the Catholic Church along with those by Philip and Thomas, she was privy to teachings from Christ that he never gave to other apostles. She was privy to teachings from Christ that he never gave to other apostles. This is again consistent with their being married, for they were more intimate and surely had times in which they were alone together for these lessons to take place. The books of Apocryphy, Apocryphia also relate how she was considered the first disciple above all others, again revealing their close relationship and the esteem in which he held her making a life in France. Now, as the sun sets, as the video begins to get darker, family, I'm going to keep on doing these videos. Some I might do on Zoom, some I might not do. Some I might live stream, some I might. A lot of people say, why don't you just go? Why don't you just go and, you know, put them out there into the masses, you know, make money for your work, and uh, that's going to come. But I can't expect everybody to understand this work. And this work isn't for everybody. Most of the people on this planet are already dead in this physical world, which is a trap in itself. The ones that choose to awaken, that's the ones that the light will shine on. Why do you guys think this is a game? We had prophets, sages, foreseers back in the time of Jesus. Why should we have those now? You got it really fucked up, guys. How dare you go to church and praise Christ and don't even appreciate the Christ inside you? You doubt yourself. It used to be television relating to the world. Now the world is relating to television. We used to live life. Now we let the media tell us what our life is, how far we came. How far we came. I'm about to end this. Guys got it fucked up, man. You don't appreciate your own value. Your own worth. You seek validation. 
in the exterior. Yes, in the interior. After Jesus had recovered from his wounds and the ordeal of being crucified, he told his disciples that he was alive and was planning to flee the area. It's only natural to assume that he also filled them in about the plot with Pilate and Joseph of Arimathea and stressed that he needed to keep his survival secret. He then told them to say that he ascended into heaven and gave them their final instructions to go out in twos to preach to other lands. Christ then left Israel with his mother, Mary Madeline, Joseph of Arimathea, and several disciples. And Jer let me let me separate that so you guys don't think his mother was Mary Mary mother, uh, Mary Madeline, because his mother also name was Mary. So let me read that again. Christ then left Israel with his mother, also Mary Madeline, Joseph of Arimathea, and several disciples, and journeyed in disguise up to the coast to Tyre, as T Y R E. There they boarded a ship and went to Ephesus, in modern day Turkey, where he. They, and where they stayed for a short time. Francine said that in Ephesus, Jesus rented a house for his mother to live in and left several of his disciples to watch over her. He then told Joseph of Arimathea to take their ship and go to Britain to establish a base for his new religion there. For Christ knew that he had many mining interests and connections in that area. He told Joseph that he, reunite, he would reunite with him and Ephesus in three years, and that he and Mary Madeline were going to the far east, Tibet, places like that, Egypt. So with Joseph off to the British Isles and his mother safely taken care of in Ephesus, Jesus and his wife set off from for India, where several more disciples accompanied them. They booked passages on caravans for better protection and arrived several months later. Jesus and Mary Madeline spent many months in India, Kashmir and what's now known as Pakistan and according to Francine they were welcome everywhere they went. Along the way they spoke to many who became followers and these people essentially became the first Gnostic Christians. Rome had little influence in the Far East so there wasn't much fear of Christ being apprehended but he did need to check on his mother and meet Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph has spent a very productive three years away from Jesus. Francine says that not only did he maintain his mining interests, but he also made many converts and started to build a church in Glastonbury, England, which is said to be the oldest above-ground Christian church in the world. In addition, Joseph was able to explore the nearby country of France. So when he and Jesus met again in Ephesus, uh, it was he who suggested that France would be a good place for the couple to make their home. Thus, Mary Madeline and Jesus picked up his mother and the other disciples and set sail for France. They landed near Marseille and went to a bit inland, eventually settling close to Rennes Le Chateau area in the Languac region. Francine said that Mary Madeline had already given birth to their first child, a girl named Sarah, by the time they arrived. She also states that they spent many years in southern France and actually had seven children, of which only four survived. Y'all hear that chopper, don't y'all? Huh? According to Francine, the local people in the area became very protective and kept all of the Holy Family secrets very well, including that Jesus was Judaic royalty, descended from David and Mary. Madeline came from a wealthy family that also had ties to royalty. Jesus, Mary, and the children weren't threatened in any way, and they were safely hidden away by their neighbors when any danger did happen to appear on the horizon. As time went on, Mary Madeline became really active in preaching and teaching. While Jesus would give the occasional sermon and do infrequent healings, he mainly confined himself to instructing children and writing. This probably was done to lessen notoriety, notoriety, yeah, and fame and to keep his location a secret more than anything else. Jesus did take a trip or two to Britain with Joseph. But these were very low-key. Mary, on the other hand, traveled in a wider circle and consequently became much revered in the whole of southern France. And the whole of southern France did. Though Ford created a massive cover-up that's still perpetrated to this day, the church 
the church has painted itself into a corner with all of its oppression. And indeed, there would be earth-shaking ramifications in the whole Christian world if the facts ever become common knowledge, which I predict will happen someday. In fact, so much has already come out in new discoveries and will continue to do so. We got too much more family. I think y'all can uh, rock it with me as it gets darker. In fact, so much has already come out in new discoveries and will continue to do so, despite religions trying to suppress it. The facts are there for those who want to research them, but humankind's troubling penchant for apathy, A-P-A-T-H-Y, along with an unbelievable religious attitude of rejecting truth, even when it's indisputable, such as with many prostate faiths, or prostate faiths, will keep them in dark ages. And that's so true. And that's so true, family. Because a lot of Christians, and even uh, Islam brothers, but especially Christians, the truth can be standing right in their face. It's written all in the face. And they will still, still disregard it because they have been programmed. They have been doctrined with this. Their belief is their belief. And it's not based on research and truth. It's based on what they've been programmed. What Big Mama them and Pop Out taught them. And who's going to argue with Big Mama and Pop Out, right? Exactly. Unfortunately, many Christians will have to continue to wallow in their self-made world of ignorance and prejudice. This is a sad part that I'm going to leave y'all with. But it, it can get better for those who watch channels like this and for those who research. But it says, unfortunately, many Christians will have to continue to wallow in their self-made world of ignorance and prejudice. Blindly following so-called leaders who continually preach very dangerous concepts such as guilt and fear. I, I don't even have time to take it there right now. These zealots prey on those who truly believe in their dogmas of a fearful and vengeful God, even as they fill their coffers with ill-gotten gains. Churches just keep emphasizing that we need to be afraid of God and repent for our sins. Wake up, people, she says. Wake up, people, I say. God is merciful, forgiving, and loving. He knows the plane of existence we're in and all its temptations. So he understands that all of us will transgress in varying degrees. Since Jesus forgave all those who were pure of heart, wouldn't our creator, I mean the supreme creator, was I'm saying, creator is what she's saying, but I'm saying supreme creator. Wouldn't our creator do the same? Christ is the Messiah for those of us who believe in an all-loving God. For those of you who think that God is to be feared, look elsewhere for your Savior, for he isn't Jesus Christ. If you'd like to read more books about what I brought up in this chapter, I suggest beginning with Holy Blood, Holy Grail. And for those who don't have a pen and paper right now, for those who haven't been enlightened, whatever. Because some of you are just here just to argue, just to hate. And haters are very well needed because they bring truth to the one that's being hated on. Christ wasn't executed by the Romans. While some of the research from that book has proven to be suspect, its main premises remain true. And I commend the authors for their daring because they got others to search further into the enigmas they describe. And I'm about to call out a bunch of books before I end this. And I thank y'all for rocking with me for almost an hour. I don't have time for shortcomings now. I have a whole world to teach. And to enlighten. Everybody won't appreciate it. And everybody won't make it. But some of you and a lot of you will. So I'm going to read out some of these books. Because it's getting dark. The Dark Side of Christian History. By Helen. Elibby. And that's Helen. H-E-L-E-N. Last name is E-L-L-E-R-B-E. -L -L -E -E. Once again. That book is The Dark Side of Christian History. Another book is called The Woman with the alabaster jar. And that's the woman with the alabaster jar. Mary Mallon and the Holy Grail. By Margaret Starbird. 
Another book is the Gnostic, the Gnostic Gospels and Beyond Belief. Gnostic, G-N-O-S-T-C-I, excuse me, G-N-O-S-T-I-C. The Gnostic Gospels and Beyond Belief. The Secret Gospel of Thomas by Elaine Pagels, that's P-A-G-E-L's. The Secret Gospel of Thomas. The Story Behind Who Changed the Bible and Why by Bart D. Ehrman, and that's Bart D. E-H-R-M-A-N. And of course, The Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown. So now I know who Dan Brown is. I highly recommend all of these works and remind you to think for yourself on this and other subjects. And for those who have watched me for a whole hour, I thank you. My life is a Christ consciousness, the son of the mother and father God. You got to understand something, family. They did not give you all your work and your religious sets. You are so much powerful than you really are. And I said this enough. I'm just going to start slamming all the proof right in your face. So much proof that you're going to have no choice but to believe in yourself and believe in the words that I'm giving you. Christ is alive and he is within us all. Christ is alive. The mother God is alive and well. For those who want to drown in ignorance, please. But for the ones who want to rise in bliss and know they are greater in a swirl full of illusions, welcome to the age of Aquarius. Class is in session. I'll talk to you next time. Peace.